Just to explain who I come from, uh, where I come from, Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, or OHCOW or OCOW. Uh, for years we tried to uh, avoid the acronym, but uh, we've come to embrace it. <laughs> no use trying to hide. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary uh, group of uh, health occupational health professionals. We have physicians, uh, Dr. Ted Haynes here, uh, is with me today. Uh, health nurses, we have a student nurse here too. Uh, Kate, uh, ergonomists, hygienists, and client service coordinators. We're funded through the Ministry of Labor, although some of our money does come through the WSIB, and we've been funded. Uh, our history of funding is very convoluted. Currently, our board of directors are all labor representatives. Just a bit of by history, the very first clinic was set up in 81 by local 1005, the steel workers in Hamilton at Stelco. And you can see Dr. Ted Haynes was one of the originals uh, way back then. It went through a, a few iterations, uh, including uh, Stan Gray was a very co colorful leader of some of the clinics. Uh, some of you who've been around in health and safety may have heard that name. And uh, it eventually, in 1989, um, the Ministry of Labor funded uh, a couple of clinics, one in Toronto, one in Hamilton, and it grew into the six clinics that we have now in uh, Windsor, Sarnia, uh, Toronto, Hamilton, uh, Sudbury, and a part-time one in Thunder Bay now. So what does OCOW do? Well, we're available for workers who have either concerns or actually have medical conditions. And what we're interested in is whether the exposure and the medical condition are related. And uh, we evaluate the evidence for that, and if we find a relationship, our mandate is prevention. So then we try to work back with the workplace parties to reduce the exposures that cause the problem. And we also work with the medical people because uh, some of the physicians who are dealing with these patients don't have a good appreciation of how the workplace affects uh, the disease they're, they're dealing with or their treatment. So the type of services we provide, if you walk into our office, we're like a medical clinic, you can, the waiting room, the typical scene. Uh, but we also answer questions about work-related health issues. We do information presentations like this. But we also visit workplace. If we're requested by the co-chairs of the Joint Health and Safety Committee, who are our clients, uh, we can go in and help them, and we can do that uh, individually as hygienist or ergonomist or nurse, or we can do it as a group if it's a complicated issue. And some of these uh, develop into fairly elaborate health and exposure uh, investigations. So what's a chemical engineer doing measuring stress? <laughs> well, um, it's mostly because of working in the clinic. Uh, a lot of uh, workers come to the clinic with their concerns, and one of the concerns that really led us to look at stress was the Plastimate fire in 1997. Uh, and we've been following these workers ever since uh, on an annual basis, and we evaluate their symptoms and things like that. So we we actually developed a customized scale for for firefighters based on their on uh, uh, open-ended questions we asked for the first few years, the type of uh, stress issues that they're concerned about, and also doing indoor air quality. Uh, if we're trying to figure out what causes people to have headaches and feel tired and lousy, uh, stress often plays a role in there. So uh, in order to measure all the things that make them feel that way, we added uh, in 2000, some of Kerasex uh, job demand uh, questions to our indoor air quality. Now, the whole issue if, is uh, if you can't measure it, you can't deal with it. But this is actually a misquote from Fleming. If you actually read his work, he says there are certain very important things that you can't measure. Like on Valentine's, if your partner says, how much do you love me? You better not <laughs> quote anything less than 100%. <laughs> and so certain things uh, can, that are important can't be measured. Then there's the issue of objective and subjective measures. And there's uh, obviously a bias that objective is better than subjective. However, if we're dealing with perceived stress, 
uh, which is a psychological strain, the gold standard is pretty subjective. So objective measures. Uh, an objective measure of stress in a workplace might be the number of days absent due to stress leave. But if you're an HR person, you can tell me how unscientific that is. Uh, there are biological markers um, from the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis uh, which re respond to stress. However, the relationship between uh, that and the type of stress is really difficult to, uh, to quantify uh, because the physical stress, for instance, will also cause uh, this, like uh, exercise. So what we saw, we found this little uh, online, <laughs> found this little gadget that measures uh, skin conductivity, uh, and uh, that's a, a measure of arousal. And we looked at that, and this was quite interesting. It's a six-year-old school girl's uh, school day, and she's in uh, music lessons at first, and that's somewhat stressful, especially when she has to sing. Um, then she's in class and reading, very little stress. But then. Uh, she goes out for recess and experiences a, a bullying incident where it goes up. But also, they have a double phys ed uh, period, and there's a lot of stress that measures on there, obviously. But the interesting thing is when she recounts the uh, bullying experience at home at night, she relives the experience, the stress response that she had there. But you can see it's confusing. Some of this stress is the stress that we're concerned about, but stress due to uh, a double period of physical education is not necessary. So uh, trying to figure out what it's measuring can be difficult. Also, if you look at the DSM-4, uh, which is supposed to be the gold standard for diagnosis of uh, psychological diseases, a lot of them are based on symptoms. For instance, this is for major depressive uh, episodes. Five or more of the following symptoms present during the same two-week period and representing a change from previous functioning. Again, it's, 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 it's not, it's not um, don't take some blood and figure out that somebody is depressed. Recently, it was interesting, uh, Health Canada posted uh, a proposed methodology to study wind turbine noise and the effects on people. And uh, they made a big deal about objective and subjective measures. And their objective measures for measuring chronic stress due to wind turbine noise was blood pressure and hair cortisol. Hair cortisol is a chronic, an indicator of chronic stress. But when you look at these uh, measures in the literature, sure, if blood pressure as a measure of hypertension is uh, fairly solid, uh, however, blood pressure as a measure of stress, and particularly the stress caused by wind turbine noise, is quite, quite a stretch. And for, for Health Canada to, to imply that that's objective, solid science, whereas uh, questionnaires about how you feel about your stress is subjective and not as, is, is quite surprising in this day and age. Also, um, this topic is about measurement, but measurement uh, to lay to workers and measurement to people like yourselves means two different things. Stress is a theoretical construct, not directly observable, and establishing the psychometric properties of measures of stress has its challenges. Uh, for instance, how you feel about your stress in your workplace right now and let's say there's a major announcement in this organization, either positive or negative, your stress by this afternoon can be very different. And uh, that, that's proven to be uh, somewhat difficult uh, in the, the formal uh, evaluation of stress measures. However, laypersons understand very quickly, <laughs> immediately, whether or not they're stressed or not. Uh, so what we're wondering is, can we use some of this science to help workers measure stress in the workplace, even though uh, there are problems going both ways? So uh, this is the outline. I just go over the history of why we got into this, some of the perspectives, the tool itself, how it's administered and analyzed, and once we find the
problems, what do we do about it then? First of all, the history. Uh, this grew out of a stakeholder consultation that OCAL did with union reps, and these were people who were either in health and safety or in compensation. And we had a, a, a workshop where we looked at different tools in different uh, areas. And Linda Robson, I believe, was attending uh, that one. And the topic that received the most interest, the, the one that the rep said, the, this is what my members are calling and complaining about, was stress. And uh, not only uh, establishing it, that it's a problem in the workplace, but also getting compensation for, uh, for mental injuries. So they set up a meeting when we looked at various tools, and in February we actually set up a workshop where we actually did some of the questionnaires and looked at the content of it. And based on these deliberations, we decided to go with the Copenhagen Psychosocial or COPSUC survey, and we tested it at a number of uh, union conferences. The results of these we presented at a conference in Ottawa, and Based on these trials, we decided to go with the COPSUC. And the, uh, right now, tomorrow, we're going to launch a tool along with a guidebook through uh, an online webinar. And I think that's how you found out about this. So uh, it's a whole group of people involved. Uh, most of them are uh, union health and safety reps, but we also have some people from the Office of the Worker Advisor, the Workers' Health and Safety Center. Uh, from pre-MSD, from LOARC, and from other organizations. But it's been done before. We're, we're not the first ones to do this, and we're piggybacking off of some of their work. In Spain, uh, a group called ISTAS is an academic group that worked with unions and created a tool. And it's literally been used in thousands of workplaces in Europe and a few in, in Canada also. Uh, Dr. Ted Haynes has used it in, in some of his studies. So the overall strategy of this group was to create a tool that allows people in the shop floor to collect data uh, to make changes in their workplace. So it has to be relevant to them. They have to be able to uh, make a quote, unquote, diagnosis and work on changes based on that. But they would also feed that data back to the unions, and each union would collect information and try to find trends so it could s support uh, sector-specific uh, issues that come around. And then the unions together would pool the data and then try to push for legislative and compensated changes. Okay. Uh, we had to deal with the issue of perspective because uh, there, there are differing perspectives on stress. Uh, behavioralism, behavior-based safety, uh, where you're trying to, you don't worry about the person. It's, you just uh, try to control behavior by positive or negative reinforcements, mostly negative with behavior-based safety. Um, then there's the other perspective, which looks at personality determines behavior, the type of person you are. And there's a whole, the five famous uh, personality traits that you can uh, classify people into. A more recent uh, development of this one is that how you appraise the environment reflects your attribution style, and your personality traits determine your coping uh, style, and that will determine your behavior. Uh, a more, I think, balanced one is reciprocal determinism, which basically states it goes back and forth. If you're looking for the chicken and the egg, you now never find it because there's a continual interaction between each of the three elements with each other. So uh, as behavior changes, if you change somebody's behavior, it affects their personality. Changes in personality affect behavior. Behavior affects the environment, because collectively we end the environment again, just behavior and back and forth with environment and personality also. So, and if you add the effect of time over this too, you see how complex because your behavior is changing over time, your personality is changing over time, and the environment is changing over time. So when you look at it, where is the easiest place to intervene? Do you want to change personality, behavior, environment? Uh, so those were the things that we struggled with as a group. 
Now, there are two uh, broad perspectives. There's the biomedical model of stress, which looks at the individual, their behaviors, perceptions, their personality factors, and uh, that's the realm of occupational psychology. And then there's another one that's, that uh, Peter Snell calls the social epidemiological model, which uh, would more a sociological approach, approach instead of an individual. Also, we have levels of prevention, uh, looking at primary prevention at the source of the stress, so changing the job design, the organization flexibility through collective agreements, health and safety committees, policies, programs. Second, uh, dairy prevention, where you're educating people about the symptoms and the coping skills. It's wellness programs. You can also screen for early signs and tertiary where you help the victims, the people who are diagnosed with some kind of uh, psychological problem. And also, um, the exposure symptoms and survey, exposure symptoms surveys uh, can be viewed as an earlier uh, intervention in the natural history of a progression of an occupational disease. And uh, this works for all occupational disease, uh, where you're trying to catch it earlier and earlier but the earlier and earlier you try to catch it, the messier it is. Uh, the symptoms are not clear and distinct. And things like that. So you're having to use uh, um, group uh, diagnostic means like uh, surveys, etc. So who's qualified to identify psychosocial hazards? Uh, so I've got three or four different levels here. Screening, what I call what I'm labeling screening here is what workers themselves do. And if you walk into a workplace that's bad enough, a poisoned workplace, anyone who even walks in there can sense it, let alone the people who have to live it every day. Then there's observation with checklists, surveys, and resources, and a little training. Health and safety reps and activists, supervisors, can be uh, trained to identify psychosocial hazards and recommend solutions. Analysis in Europe, because they have legislation requiring employers to assess psychosocial hazards, they actually have a discipline that's called work organizational specialist, and it's like a hygienist or uh, an ergonomist safety professional at that level. It's often a master's training, and uh, they specialize in just dealing with psychosocial issues. So they would be the people who would quantitatively assess uh, the problems. The expert, depending on your perspective, again, if you're the biomedical or the sociological, it's either psychologist or the sociologist. I think in North America, the psychologists are pretty predominant. And you can see that with the CSA standards, it's called the psychological health and safety, not psychosocial health and safety. Now, this uh, setup here, the Screening, Observation, Analysis, and Expertise, S-O-B-A-N-E, which uh, spells SOBAIN, is something that Jacques Malcher from Belgium put together as a way of approaching health and safety. Uh, he was trying to respond to always trying to use uh, high-level analysis techniques to solve problems which workers themselves can clearly identify without the need of... Uh, this expertise. And he basically said that the way it should be is that workers should be able to solve most of their problems with some help from the health and safety committee level, and that uh, the quantitative uh, analysis is only needed when these uh, methods fail, and that when the hygienist, the work specialists or whatever can't solve the problem, then you call in the experts. And that should only be for a minority of problems. And that's why the triangle gets smaller and smaller as you go to the top. It's a very efficient way of using scarce resources in health and safety. Now, the CSA standard, uh, which uh, a draft was published in 2011, um, and was funded largely by Health Canada and also Bell Canada. Uh, it follows the typical ISO uh, five element uh, system where you, the vision 
is that uh, you promote workers' psychological well-being. They actually went through with the global word search and took out psychosocial and replaced it all with psychological in one of their drafts. And the key drivers being risk management, cost effectiveness, recruitment and retention, and excellence and sustainability, prevention, promotion and resolution. Uh, a very uh, fine um, structure. And then they have 13 um, areas ranging from psychological support to even a supportive physical environment. So they recognize that the physical environment can exert stress on a person also. And this actually came from Guarding Minds at Work. It's an organization out west that uh, produced some funded by the insurance companies because insurance companies uh, are worried about all the sickness and accident leaves due to stress leave. And so they put together some tools for employers to assess uh, psychological uh, risk. And the 13th uh, is the one that was added by the CSA. And this is their website. Okay, so those are the perspectives that we dealt with. And the survey tool that we picked was uh, the, the uh, COPS Copenhagen Psychosocial. But some of the other ones we looked at uh, were here. These two are very tied to one uh, theory on stress, and they're actually covered in this. Uh, the HSE's uh, indicator tool has about seven dimensions. This one has 12. Uh, this was a simple one we had experience with. And in uh, Spain, uh, they have taken the COPSA questionnaire and adapted it to their uh, situation. And when we looked at them, we felt most at home with the Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire. So what is this COPSA? Well, there's three versions, a short, medium, and long, 40, 87, and 128 questions. And we based ours on the short one, but we used uh, symptoms from the long one. And I'll explain that. So the uh, dimensions that we deal with under demands, we have quantitative, work pace, emotional, work organization, influence, development, meaning of work, commitment to the workplace, trust regarding management, justice and respect, ability, recognition, role clarity, quality of leadership, social support, these two are, well, I'm not sure if they're outcomes or <laughs> predictors. It's hard to decide. Uh, we've treated them as outcomes. And then offensive behavior, behaviors. And for the health measures, there's a the generic, uh, how would you classify your health? Uh, burnout, stress, sleeping troubles, somatic stress, cognitive stress symptoms. So we also added demographic questions and issues that were thought important to the, the unions themselves. And they were raised by the group itself, but they also came from the comments in the pilots. A lot of people said, you, you asked me about stress, but you didn't ask me about ergonomics, which is causing me a lot of stress. Uh, so there were items like that that we picked up. Plus, uh, we are flexible enough that for certain unions, like the nurses, they have issues. They wanted doctors in there as a separate source of uh, um, uh, stress, uh, actually uh, offensive behaviors, <laughs> not just clients and co-workers and superiors. And they wanted doctors added. So there were things like that that we adjusted. For the physical work environment questions, we used this pattern that uh, how well are you um, dealing with safety hazards at your workplace and then give an example of a few and then yes it's well designed or it's present but not an issue or causes some concern annoyance or it actually interferes with getting the job done or we don't have that issue and these are the uh, safety ergonomics physical hazards noise and lighting thermal comfort air quality chemicals biological hazards radiation uh, both ionizing non-ionizing and driving hazards so we intentionally left out certain questions. The questions about depression, the questions about a history of psychological problems. Because this is a tool for joint health and safety committees to use amongst people they know, 
Uh, we didn't want them diagnosing or labeling individuals, so we left the, those uh, issues out intentionally. We're also uh, not trying to create a report card, although everything looks like a report card and we're coloring it in you know, green, yellow, orange, red. Uh, so it's, it's hard to do, but we're trying to, as the cops are, uh, people themselves say, uh, create an opportunity for dialogue and trying to objectify the issues because often when a person crashes in the workplace because of stress, everybody says, oh, that person is weak or susceptible or they have other problems that explain it. They never look for, for the global issue and therefore we're trying to get everybody's experience, not just the people who stand out because of serious problems. And uh, we're also not trying to buy into just individual coping skills or mental illness supports, although these are important. And there is a section where we're promoting advocacy for the WSIB to recognize these things. But rather, we're primarily trying to get to the root cause of the issue and dealing with <coughs> that in the workplace. So how do you administer this questionnaire? Now, this is actually quite important because um, a lot of workers think oh, I have a questionnaire, I can just throw it out, and then I'll get the results back. And then we get a call saying, I got all these results, now what do I do with them? How do I interpret them? So we spend a lot of time on how to administer it. First of all, you want to make sure that the survey is the best way to do it. If it's really bad, a survey may look like a, a delay tactic. You know, everybody knows there's a problem. You're just putting this thing out there to slow things down and dealing with the real issue. So, uh, also, if doing a survey is problematic, people, there's not enough trust in the organization, going to the Health and Safety Committee or to people that are generally regarded in the workplace as wise people who understand the workplace, giving them a checklist of what to look for uh, may be a better way to go than, than doing a questionnaire. If you've got lots of good quality data, you can review absences, sickness, and accident. That might be a place to start. But if you're really serious about improving things or you want evidence to prove your case, a survey properly done could help. But you need a solid basis of commitment to get uh, in a comprehensive administration plan. Now, some of the issues are if, you're, if your group is too small, uh, you can't do much with the data. Uh, if it gets larger and larger, there's more and more we can do, but also you have to keep your unit small enough so you don't cross-contaminate what one, per one department's issue may not be another department's issue. So it, it gets uh, a little um, complicated figuring out the group size. Also response rate, we're, re we're recommending that they try to get over 80%. And anybody who's done surveys knows how difficult that is. They all say, oh, yeah, everybody's upset about this. They'll all fill it out. But then you're usually in this area or even less. So this also helps them interpret whether they're dealing with the whole group, data that represents the whole group, or they're just dealing with the respondents. Now, it's, I think it's okay just to deal with the respondents because if you solve their problems, the others who didn't respond, assuming that they just didn't care, um, may not, probably won't hurt them either, and may even benefit them. So if you're dealing with the people who are complaining, that, that may be okay. You know, obviously for academic purposes, it's not representative, etc., etc. Okay, we, we tell them about the Dillman approach to maximizing survey response, you know, do a lot of background work an announcement, then distribute the survey, a uh, reminder, a second reminder, and then set the deadline uh, to follow up. The people who devise COPSUC themselves have 10 rules. They call them soft guidelines because you're allowed to violate them. <laughs> they're not hard and fast. But uh, they're, they're, I think, very good. And the ones that I've highlighted, I think, especially yet. Yeah, Never start a survey on psychosocial environment issues unless there's a clear intention of taking action indicated. 
the worst thing you can do is get everybody involved, get their input, and then do nothing because things will actually be worse in that situation than if you didn't do the survey at all. If you know, if you don't want to do anything, then just let that be known. But if you get the appearance of caring and then don't do anything, you're worse off. Also, if you don't get good participation, <coughs> then that might itself be a sign of uh, poor psychological climate, but it may also be poor administration. Uh, anonymous, obviously. Uh, there are no standard solutions to problems, and you have to develop them locally. There are ideas that you can use from other people, and you can evaluate whether they might work in your... And the what, bit about the report card again. That this is not a report card, it's an opportunity for dialogue and development. So, doing a survey is a lot of work. <laughs> and uh, we tell these people this because, again, we, the first time they ask us, they think, oh, I can just throw these questionnaires around and they'll magically come back and we'll get the answer. So, the analysis. Okay, what, have, what we've done is we've actually created a spreadsheet. So, once you get the data, and we're encouraging people to set up Survey Monkey, so you get a standardized uh, way of getting the data. You can just put it into the spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet will produce the following report. So this is where we uh, send around a link for the eDome presentation tomorrow, and ask people to fill it out. And um, as of Friday, when I did this presentation, uh, we had 101 usable answers. Number available, I guessed it was going to be 250, but I'm, I'm not sure what that number is. Response rate is 40%, so you go down, and it's color-coded, so that uh, you'll realize that you're only representing the, this is only representing the, the people who responded, not the whole group as a whole. And then there's some demographics about uh, who responded. We ask things like uh, scheduled hours per week and actual hours, so the difference actually becomes extra hours, and you'll see that the low person actually had negative. This was a person who was returned to work. They hadn't got up to their scheduled, so it, it does make sense. Yeah. But uh, the, most of the people were full-time, uh, day shifts, although quite a few on a rig, regular shifts. Uh, we asked questions about staffing levels and workplace size. A lot of large workplaces are interested in stress on And then we have a number of questions. Do you, to what extent do you agree that your workplace has enough resources to do the job the way it should be done? This is trying to get at the worker's perspective of whether the company or the organization has uh, enough resources to do what it wants to do, and especially in, in uh, Social agencies, uh, you often find that they don't. Job security, again, uh, to what extent do you agree that your job security is good? Uh, accident investigation attitude. This was trying to get at behavior-based safety. When we did uh, the survey with the steel workers, we found that the plants that had behavior-based safety had more stress, and it was a, it was a predictor of uh, symptoms if you had a, a BPS program, and it was a negative uh, factor. And because uh, violence and harassment is now in Ontario, the law, we're asking whether they think the policy is effective or not. And this is the results of this uh, group of participants for tomorrow. The uh, workplace hazards, you can see here that air quality and thermal comfort are the most common. And it's interesting, these are the most these are not only in offices. Yeah, we find in industrial workplaces, these two are also the big issues. I was expecting, you know, uh, chemicals and noise and things like that. But, uh, uh, and when you do factor analysis, air quality, thermal comfort, ergonomics, and noise and light often uh, clump together as a single factor. And here's the, the results on the different uh, uh, dimensions compared to the reference data from Denmark. And in Denmark, it was a representative sample of Danish employees, population survey, 20 to 59 years old. And uh, generally, you'll see that 
These are a little bit less. Again, we're not representative of the Canadian population. These, these, uh, but it's interesting. <laughs> possibilities for development was bet a little bit better. These are rounded off, uh, so you can't see the difference there. But one thing that we're finding is that compared to Denmark. Uh, Canadian workers that we're seeing have a lot more of these offensive behaviors in their workplace than uh, the Danish people are reporting. And job satisfaction work and the symptoms. And then we summed uh, the different groupings of uh, dimensions together, work demands, work organization, relationship, work values, and the offensive behaviors. 67% of the people who responded had at least one uh, offensive behavior. And so our next step, because we know that the Danish is not Canadian and there are cultural differences, although I don't think they're as big, except maybe in the violent issue, uh, as people might think, we also <coughs> look at uh, what of these factors are actually associated with these symptoms. So wherever you see an X is where there's a statistically significant association. And this is from a correlation matrix. It's not multivariate, so uh, there is interaction, obviously, that isn't being accounted for. And also, we asked the number of respondents, and then that slide ahead with 15 and less, you can't say much, uh, uh, 16 to 30, et cetera, et cetera. So you see here for the e-bilm response, uh, bullying is associated with the sum of all the symptoms, discrimination with somatic symptoms. And here we have commitment to the workplace, and we're usually finding the less commitment, the more the symptoms. Predictability, uh, same thing, it's often about information, not getting enough information. Rewards, cleric role, no, not role clarity. Trust of management and justice and respect. So these may not be the most different from the Danish population, but these are the ones that are associated with the symptoms, which is not necessarily causal. And then we also ask questions about the sources of the um, behaviors. And for instance, violence, uh, threats, or actual is usually from clients, customers, and patients, whereas bullying. Uh, is often from superiors and colleagues. And when this showed up, you'll see that there's more bullying, slightly more from colleagues than uh, from managers, but we were wondering whether they would cause the same degree of symptoms. So then we looked at uh, which of these are causing symptoms, and you'll see that Bullying from managers causes a number of symptoms, but bullying from colleagues uh, does not. And the same thing with discrimination from managers. So there's a distinct, just because the frequency may be more from colleagues doesn't mean the health effect. Well, it's an association, so I can't say causal, but. And uh, we put that in here. Like, because this is just a spreadsheet that can't take interactions uh, or multivariate analysis into account, we just say there. Then we show the associations. Uh, we have a p value that gets adjusted uh, uh, for the size of the group. So, uh, if you have a small group, it's really hard to get anything in this list. And for some, we, there are no correlations. <laughs> And then this is an executive summary of all that. Uh, and at the bottom, these are the three risk factors that are uh, associated with the symptoms. So these would be the good things to focus on for prevention. And a note that this should be seen as a tool for dialogue and development, not a report card, even though we're coloring them like stoplights. So we presented this um, material for the three uh, conferences we did at X 2002 earlier this year, and this is the uh, the abstract of the presentation. It was a poster, but they also wanted us to do a five slide PowerPoint, and we had to sit beside the poster and show the PowerPoint to the people who come, and nobody came. <laughs> we were off in the obscure part of this very old building. That but anyway, you, you see, <laughs> we had pretty good participation. We basically 
either gave them, uh, yeah, for these, we just gave them the questionnaire during the plenary sessions and asked them to fill it out and collected it. Uh, so we got pretty good response. But these are health and, well, these are health and safety reps. These are union executives, and these were women. I wasn't even allowed to come here to present the results because I was male. <laughs> so I gave, sent the PowerPoint in and somebody else did it. We looked at factor analysis to see if the groups, uh, like each of these single items is two questions. And we were wondering whether the two questions would stick together. And for a commitment to the workplace, they actually got split in two different factor groupings. And the colors are representative of the grouping of dimensions. And we found the grouping of dimensions didn't hold very well, as you can see. But the individual factors of the 14, uh, there were only two that were split. And these two were split between two similar ones. So we thought the individual, uh, uh, the dual question um, dimensions held up pretty good, but the groupings did not. We also looked at uh, multivariate uh, analysis and we were wondering whether you should analyze it by the individual questions or the dimensions or the categories of dimensions or the factor analysis results. And we thought the method would be biased for the factor analysis results, but they weren't. Uh, we were actually surprised that they generally did the worst and that the individual questions did the best, although the difference between these two are very small. So, um, what we concluded is that the representatives found the questionnaire easy to fill out. It was also educational for them. Uh, the factor structure was reasonably similar to the, the design structure, although the groupings were not, the individual dimensions were. Surprisingly, the differences in symptom experiences between the sectors and union was minimal. It was a low inter... Um, I forget what I stands for. <laughs> but uh, interclass correlation coefficient. Um, but uh, the risk factors were quite varied, but the symptoms they caused are similar. Uh, regression analysis indicated risk factors consistent with what you find in Demands is a big issue, especially emotional demands, uh, rewards, again. And the risk factors are frequently, that were most frequently associated with the scores were working at a high pace, dealing with emotionally disturbing situations, and bullying. So we thought this was fairly successful, and the committee decided that this would be the basis of our tool based on, on this. So. Once you've found the risk factors, how do you address them? What we're telling health and safety committees to do is try to pick the three issues they feel most capable of. There's a, a three at the bottom, but if you find other ones, uh, you know, feel free to do with them if you think you can do better. Um, look for online resources, and we're, we've developed a, a guidebook that steers people to these. And they, really discouraging people from taking it out by themselves uh, in order to get buy-in and everything you need, some kind of committee. The International Labor Organization has put out this wonderful booklet with lots of pictures and very short 50 topics which identify specific issues and identify prevention strategies, like for instance, workload. Uh, it gives ideas, I like this one, uh, reduce unnecessary tasks and control operations, writing reports, filling reports, <laughs> registration work. It's, there's a whole bunch of them. At least there. And also in Europe, the, um, there's a campaign on for labor inspectors. And they're focusing on psychosocial issues this year. So they have all kinds of resources. And especially in Denmark, they've developed some nice checklists for labor inspectors to assess uh, the presence of uh, psychosocial hazards and to recommend solutions. And for instance, for hospitals, they have to, they're all sector specific. The issues they, they identified as typical is workload, emotional demands, violence, bullying, sexual harassment, and relationships. And their recommendations for workload are, are um, again, uh, very practical issues on how to deal with some of them 
may be controversial for union staff because <coughs> hiring temporary staff to take up the stock may not be in the union's long-term interests or stable workplace relationships. Emotional demands, uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, I'd really like this one, the possibility of withdrawing a place for privacy if you're dealing with an, a very, an incident, a very emotional incident, a place where you can just gather your, yourself back together again and then uh, go back and face the issues you're dealing with every day. Uh, Canadian Mental Health Association has a work, workplace mental health promotion how-to guide. Uh, this is more along the wellness issue and it's um, very, very detailed uh, for a very small workplace. It may be a bit too bureaucratic, but for a large workplace. Also, the Laval Business Group, with uh, the help of the IRSSD and the IAPA, uh, have put together these booklets. Well, booklet one is more information about the scope of the stress problem. Booklet two is what causes it. And booklet three is uh, solving the problem. And it's aimed at, um, as you can imagine, from a business group to lawyers. The Sobane people in Belgium have translated their psychosocial uh, one, and it's the uh, screening and observation tools. So it's at the shop floor and at the health and safety committee level. And it's very usable, but typical of the EU, extremely bureaucratic. Lots of checklists and meetings and things like that. And unions. Uh, the unions that we're working with are developing uh, supports. Uh, they will be setting up the Survey Monkey or whatever uh, accounts and collecting the data and using the spreadsheet and providing it back to the individual workplaces along with covering memos, helping people to interpret them. And also if they see patterns, they can identify resources that uh, they know work in one workplace that may also help in another. And we've been uh, providing backup tech for these people. And we're considering and developing a one-day training session for activists on how to use the tool and how to apply the results in finding. So that's the end. Uh, sorry for <laughs> pushing you through so much. Thank you, John. For, uh...